was the best deal I ever did. As far as management, as uh, far as concept. Out on the uh, field, they're demonstrating the color-coded pants. It's an idea that the players did not treat with overwhelming warmth. You know, we wanted to tell the real story, and I'm like, well, what's the real story? It's a bunch of crazy people that played a year and a half in a league with funny logo. I mean, what are you talking about, the real story? This isn't Watergate, and they're like, no, they got to tell the real story. It's time for professional football, and tonight's game between the World Football League, Birmingham Americans, and the Southern California Sun. You either did it or you didn't play football. And as an athlete, that's what you did. It shaped my life in a way of dealing with people and, and seeing what was important to me and, and to help touch certain dreams. Over the past 40 years, we've shot over 100 million feet of film. And every so often, we find a few hundred feet that, well, we don't know why we shot it, like in this can we found footage of a 1977 tryout camp. And this stuff was never even touched. Five. Row five. When we Waller's went through it, camp. we recognized some of the people. There's Ron Waller, who had been head coach of the Chargers. He ran the camp. Helping out were some former players, like King Corcoran, a quarterback we once featured in a film on minor league football. We also recognized two of the King's teammates, running backs Claude Watts and John Land. That's all right. We don't care about the linebackers. And there's Vince Papali, who never played college football, but made it with the Philadelphia Eagles. These guys all had one thing in common. In the mid-1970s, they were teammates with the Philadelphia Bell of the World Football League. Now, if you never heard of the World Football League, don't feel bad. I hardly remember it myself. It only lasted a year and a half. Someone suggested the WFL would make a perfect Lost Treasures show, but we didn't have any WFL footage in our library. But then why would we? Because they were our competition. So, okay, the footage wasn't a Lost Treasure because we never had it in the first place. But we felt there was a film in the men who played in the WFL and the people who supported those teams. They were the real Lost Treasures. The question was, how do we find them? Let's go, let's go, pick it up. Right, we're good. Well, there was another Corcoran at that tryout camp, and that was the King's son, Jimmy Jr., who was helping out. More, 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 more. Uh, and when we tracked him down in Florida, we found a one-man repository for WFL history. I was a ball boy for the Philadelphia Bell. I worked, and I worked in the equipment room. He ran a 474 before. I used to collect equipment. I collect, my father would always give me the jerseys and the helmets, and it just became like something that I became good at it, like recognizing the tags and stuff and so as I got older I mean they, they came out with these helmets a couple years about two years ago JC Wingo as a man who was the vice president of Rydell he came out with the company that produced these and he actually got one of them wrong I redesigned the Philadelphia Bell for him I called him up on the phone and said you, you know you got some of the logos wrong and stuff and I, I just I ended up getting the whole series I ended I, I was originally just gonna get the Philadelphia Bell but it brought back so many good memories of being a kid and being on the sidelines and when my father played in the NFL he was just a, a journeyman quarterback when you got to the World Football League, even though it was only a year and a half, it seemed like these games were life or death. It, it just, it seemed like they were so big and so important. You know, he'd come on his day off and he'd be like, big game, man, you know, Florida Blazers, gotta stop Tommy Riemann, you know, gotta stop Greg Ladder, gotta stop Hubie Bryant, you know, he'd name off all the players. And I got to, you know, I knew every player in the league just by him coming, you know, every, you know, gotta stop James McAllister, got a California sign, gotta stop Tony Adams. Now that it's 25 years later and, and I look back on it, it seems like everybody forgot all about the World Football League. It seems like, except for me and a few people out there, it just seems like nobody remembers the players or nobody remembers the teams or, or anything like that anymore. Look at this one. Jimmy led us to two diehards yeah. who lived near Getting Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> Tony Walls and Greg Allred are among the few remaining authorities on the WFL. They've stocked a warehouse full of pennants, programs, seat cushions, and football cards. Greg claims his most prized possession is this Jacksonville Sharks ashtray. I think the pursuit is as, 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 as the fun it is. as the acquisition. You know, when, when, I, when I got this helmet. Your heart was beating fast? Boy, yeah, it was great. We've got, uh, got a Philadelphia Bell jersey, have a, uh, a Florida Blazers jersey worn by Tommy Riemann, probably in that photograph we just looked at. Ron Curl's Chicago Winds jersey. 
that Charlie Haraway's jersey he wore in the Warl Bowl. Damn. As a 14-year-old kid, you didn't you didn't know that it was a business. I didn't. I mean, you, you knew the player, players were getting paid and stuff, but we thought they did it for us. Yeah, really. They were doing it, doing it for us. I think most folks, they have fond memories of it. They they want to see it remembered in a positive light, and this is one way of doing it. To say, look, this does not belong in you know uh, a dumpster somewhere. I was noticing that you've got back behind us the the World Bowl trophy from the old World Football League. Yes. Uh, Greg, that, that's uh, a, a prize that we have, uh, and I'm really not sure how we came about it. Actually, the trophy sat in a storeroom at Legion Field for 22 years until a pipe fitter found it in a box and turned it over to the Hall of Fame. Do you have a lot of people uh, coming in saying, where's that world uh, football team? <laughs> no, we don't, and many of them that come through here actually are uh, not familiar with that, as you know, because it's been... 25 years ago. I'm not sure if it's an illness or if it's just uh, uh, maybe our, our calendars got stuck in the 70s or something. I don't know. You become a fan and it's something that doesn't really go away. And then as time goes on, uh, you become nostalgic for your childhood and th the things that you identify with you know, being happy, I guess. When I, when I was a kid, I went to the Birmingham Florida Blazers game, pouring down rain. As the players were, were leaving the, the field, uh, a bunch of us kids reached out and you know to slap their hands and um, Paul Robinson reached out and just slapped my hand and uh, I thought that was really neat you know from for, you know a kid from Hansville Alabama who had never seen a pro football game before that was a big thing <laughs> well, we hear there's this restaurant that uh, opened in the last year or so that it has all this kind of stuff you ever heard about it Carlisle's Carlisle's I, I gotta see this place I gotta see this place that's a must see now so we went to Carlisle's and found three men who met and became friends through the WFL's Birmingham Americans, the former ticket manager, the kicker, and the president of the Booster Club. We had, uh, we had the largest booster club in the history of, of football. Uh, we would have maybe a thousand people at the, at the Hyde House, and it, it got so large we had to move from the Hyde House, we had to move to the municipal auditorium. Governor Wallace. Governor Wallace, we had him to proclaim Birmingham Americans Day for the state of Alabama. That's the actual certificate that he signed. That's the original proclamation right there that I've kept over these years that he signed. Now, I'm not sure we had the most stable ownership the first year or leadership. And just cringe when you think about uh, Bill Putnam, who owned the team the first year, he chose as president of the team Carol Stallworth, who had been a barmaid here in Birmingham at a hotel. And there again, I think Carol Stallworth was window dressing. Yeah. Uh, there was behind the scenes work being done, but there, I think, from a prestige standpoint, we were lacking. But was that, she any good as president? We had new leadership the second year. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, well, don't you think running a bar would be good experience for running a football team? Actually, it was. Carol provided the only break from the drudgery of training camp in Marion, Alabama. Very strict atmosphere, and they didn't have any advantage to go into town and dance and things like that. So their first trip to Birmingham, we rented them a couple of buses, brought them over to Carol Stallworth's house, and I had 40 models from charm schools and things like that in town. 40 models meet them at the bus, and, and, and each lady would be the gentleman's you know, escort for the night. And, and it went real well. There's a swimming pool back there. We had a luau party, a dance, they had a great band. And about an hour into the party, all the lights went out. And what happened, one of the players just didn't want all the lights. So lights came on about 30 minutes later, and we couldn't find the players at first, but they started popping up. So all the players wrote me a thank you note. And I Jack bet they Gold, did. Jack Gota said, Joe, that's the only thing they've ever agreed on. That was the best party they've ever been to in their life. And he said, what's so funny is the next day they were supposed to come down to Marion for practice. He said, I had to have cabs going up and down the expressway trying to find my ball players, to, trying to thumb back down to Marion. But the community literally embraced our players. You talking about that night? That night, and for both. <laughs> were there any marriages that resulted from that night? That yes. party? <laughs> Just divorces. <laughs> like that party, the World Football League was fun while it lasted but everyone woke up with a hangover and only a hazy memory of what had happened. What's the real story? It's a bunch of crazy people that played a year and a half in a league with funny logo. I mean, what are you talking about, the real story? This isn't Watergate. Hello? WFL, like these game programs, was fairly easy. But what we really needed was action footage and broadcast tapes. And we were told that 
Most of that stuff was either lost or erased. So we went back to Greg and Tony. I had uh, some film that you made for me on the video and stick it in and people would come in, who's that, Alabama or Auburn? Uh, the Birmingham Americans, nobody knew who I was talking sure. about. But I'd sit there and watch it for hours. I'd lock the door and watch sure. it for hours, you know, and grainy film of somebody you don't remember hardly. Well, I don't Basically, remember. it was all black and white. Yeah, just black and white. You can't, you can't You're tell rewinding World Football League film from 27 Double. years ago. This was 16 millimeter film shot off a screen with a camcorder. That's the Philadelphia Bell and the Charlotte Hornets, I think. You can see what's going on, but uh, it isn't exactly broadcast quality. Then we came across this film from a rookie talent show at the Birmingham training camp in 1974. Now we're on to something. We figured the guy who shot this must have more footage in his basement somewhere. We just had to find him, and we did. His name is Louis Bice, and he's video director for the University of Alabama Birmingham football team. 25 years ago, Lewis was on another kind of tower, in the press box at Legion Field. That's his wife and daughter heading to their seats. Lewis shot the games, processed and printed the film, then packaged the highlights. The footage here was shot to grade the players and to see what, what they needed to improve on for the next game. This was used to take to the next town as promo film. The sports information director would We'd cut the highlights out and make a 100-foot roll, uh, possibly out of the highlights. He'd take it to the next town that we were playing in, to the TV stations, and they'd try to drum up interest in the World Football League that way. The problem was, most of the best stuff from those TV highlights never made it back into the original reel, so it was lost. But there was still enough left to show you just how well Lewis covered the action. There's George Myra the ex-49er getting clotheslined by the Florida Blazers. And there's Charlie Haraway, who started for the Redskins in Super Bowl VII. Lewis was down on the sidelines, risking his camera and his body to get the shot, just like our guys do today. This is a Bell and & Howell, and it first came out as a combat camera in World War II, and it was a 100-foot camera, just this part of it. And you wound it on the side with a spring wind, uh, but it was durable and uh, we could use that with a 100 foot load. 100 feet of film lasts two minutes and 41 seconds at 24 frames per second. So at 64 frames, you had just about a minute. So it was constantly changing film. And of course, we missed some. And uh, you'd miss some while you were threading, re reloading. We did run out quite frequently. If you got a 40 yard run, you, you might only have 38 yards of film, but that was the best thing going at that time. We use 400-foot magazines today, so we rarely miss a big play. 25 years ago, it was harder with the short rolls, but Lewis still got what we call the money shots. You know, I wish I'd known him back then. We would have hired him in a second. He also knew how to work the sidelines and the bench area to capture the personalities and the drama. He covered the news as well like the 1974 championship game when the league presented the MVP award to three players. It was a ceremony that defined the WFL, a league that was sinking in red ink by the end of that first year. When the, the time came to actually present them with the money, as opposed to giving them a check like you normally see with the ceremony, a large check, and then you give them the real thing later on, they opted not to take the check. They said, we don't like the history and the track record that you've had with your checks, so we prefer you to bring us cash. I think really that, that they wanted to excite the people with the volume of the money out there, because I, if I remember right, it was all in $1 bills. In the, in the photograph, you have Alex Hawkins, who is one of the TVS commentators, along with uh, Tony Adams, who was one of the tri-MVPs for the Southern California Sun, and Miss Florida, so why she came up for the World Bowl, but we can't find Miss Alabama, we're not sure. But uh, afterward, then he reaches over and plants a kiss on Miss Florida, and then uh, not sure whether that was planned or not, but uh, he got his money, he got his kiss, and so he got out. Take a closer look at Miss Florida. Talk about a lost treasure. That's Delta Burke, who went on to become a TV star. But she was a designing woman even then. If we could ever find the TVS broadcast, the actual broadcast of I mean, obviously the World Bowl would be, be the big find, but any TVS broadcast. I hold in my hand the ultimate lost treasure 
of the WFL. A fourth generation copy of a copy of the first national TV broadcast. The network taped over the original, so don't adjust your set. Ignore the static and the rolling picture. This is TV history, so you take what you can get. Tonight, live and in color, TBS presents the new game in town, the World Football League. The first week's crowds were pretty good, and we're even where we were in Jacksonville for the opening game, 40,000 or something. Philadelphia opened with about 55,000. And everybody was very encouraged. Hi, I'm Earl Herman, and welcome to the new game in town, the World Football League. Last night at approximately 8.08 p.m., this football was kicked off in Orlando, Florida, launching the start of the WFL. Tommy Durrance, the former Florida star for about three. Tommy Durrance, uh, yes. As we were saying. That's colorful. <laughs> nice crowd here tonight. Those are the morales, incidentally, a group of Jacksonville girls, that shot you just saw there. And we went to this celebrity third person in the booth, and we had McLean Stevenson and Burt Reynolds and uh, a few others that knew their football, that played football, and they were now entertainment celebrities. But really, there hasn't been that much of a surprise, has there? It's been, uh, I mean, what, what is it, what, I should ask you this. Is there anything that surprised you? I learned once again how hard it is to start up a league, even with maximum exposure. Next Thursday night, Portland at Memphis, and we'll be there to bring it to you, 9 p.m. Very vulnerable in football, because football was dealing with all three networks at the time, and you can't get one of the big networks to jump with you. The USFL had the same problems because they all have an interest in the NFL. Delighted to have you with us tonight from the beautiful Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, Florida. So I don't think you'll see any new leagues in the major sports ever again. Let's pause for station identification. This is the TVS Television Network. Guys in the history of professional football in America who played, owned, and coached pro football team all at the same time. I would say George Howells will be the one, but uh, the second one doesn't exactly come to mind. Yeah, John Wilbur. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I've known John Wilbur for 30 years, but it wasn't until we interviewed him last summer for another show that I found out that he played and coached and was a part owner of a WFL team in Hawaii. So I got a chance to, you know, coach at the professional level, and it was wasn't quite the NFL, but it was, you know, two-thirds of the NFL. You know, the quality of the talent. A lot of the players ended up in the NFL. There were two kinds of players in the WFL, those on the way out and those on the way up. Alfred Jenkins was a young receiver who showed promise with Birmingham and then blossomed into an all-pro with the Atlanta Falcons. Jack Dolvin played for the Chicago Fire before starting in a Super Bowl with Denver. Today, he is a chiropractor. I had the opportunity to try out, and I showed up one day at Soldier Field. I remember I borrowed my wife's contacts. I couldn't see, and I didn't have any money. I was working as a store detective with J.C. Penney, and uh, of 160 players, they signed four of us, and I was one of them. Wyatt was right with Jack Dalton, the flanker. Uh, that team folded, and I ended up back at J.C. Penney's chasing shoplifters. Chasing dreams is what Vince Papali did. Before Vince made the Philadelphia Eagles as a 30-year-old free agent, he played for the Philadelphia Bell, where the coaches questioned his credentials. So he started asking me about myself, and he said, well, where'd you, uh, where'd you play your college football? <laughs> well, you know, I've been playing a college football coach, but I played high school football, you know. He said, well, how old are you? I said, 24. So I was 28 at the time. I lied about my age. He says, um, well, what do you know about football? I said, well, I'm a defensive coordinator from a high school football team, Interboro. Vince actually caught the first pass in WFL history. We don't have that shot, but we did find a few others. <laughs> you got to be kidding. You have footage of me in the World Football League? I, I got to see that. I have to see that. There's Vince, 44, closing in on a Birmingham return. Man. 
Okay, so he took out a blocker and sacrificed himself so his teammates could make the play. Vince was that kind of guy. But keep watching, he'll be back. Vince never let up. See, there he is now, finishing off the play. <laughs> this is big time, baby. Danny White played 13 seasons with the Cowboys, but before that, he quarterbacked the Memphis Southmen. And here's a quarterback who was ahead of his time, David Mays, number 12 of the Houston Texans. He was a poor man's Dante Culpepper. Mays spent three years as a backup in the NFL, but this is such a great run, we had to put it in the show. Now here's a familiar face, Ben Davidson. Three years after retiring from the Raiders, he signed with the WFL for one last hurrah. I started at East LA Junior College as an amateur and I finished uh, with the Portland Storm as an amateur. They stopped paying us. I said, I've had my career. Uh, if you guys wanna stay and play, I'll stay and play. If you wanna go home, I'll go home. And uh, only one guy left, uh, interesting phenomenon. Guys were so uh, loved playing football so much that they stayed and played. And I guess I did too. A few others were actually in their prime. One was Virgil Carter. I was in Cincinnati. I hadn't signed a contract because I had a disagreement over the medical care from Paul Brown and the Bengals. I wanted to have my own second opinion because, you know, I'd led the league in injuries prior to that, and I wanted a good second opinion. Uh, and he didn't want to give me that option, so I hadn't signed. Two months later, a guy named Tom Orger calls from Chicago and says that he's starting a new league, a new team, wants to talk to me, and certainly I was available to sign because I was on my option year. Virgil Carter, the man who was Renegade. <laughs> yeah, I was the first NFL player under contract to sign in the new league. But not the last. The WFL rated the NFL for named players. Calvin Hill left the Cowboys, and Ted Qualick left the 49ers, and both signed with the Hawaiians. Ken Stabler signed with Birmingham, and Darryl LaMonica traded the silver and black of Oakland for the pastel shades of the Southern California sun. But the biggest blow to the NFL was the defection of three marquee players who helped Miami win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. I think we were all more interested in staying with the Miami Dolphins rather than going to a new league. Uh, but we needed a bargaining chip or some leverage to, to deal with the Miami Dolphins. We were in a situation where we were making $50,000 a year, which was a good salary for the NFL back then, and we were offered an opportunity to make $3.5 million over two and a half years. That's why I left the Miami Dolphins. Larry at the time just came off the MVP and was certainly a, a big name, and I guess getting Paul Warfield, the greatest receiver ever, in my opinion, in the NFL, uh, whether I was the caboose or not, I don't know. It was something new for me, and I like, uh, I like uh, taking chances and, and adventurous things. Ironically, the three Dolphins didn't make much of a splash on the field. The Caviar and Champagne boys were treated rudely by the blue-collar guys in the new league. Zonka, Kick, and Warfield came in here with Memphis, and I think, I think y'all held uh, Zonka to like 20, 30 yards rushing. Larry Zonka did not dominate. Uh, Jim Kick, Paul Warfield. They... I think I held him. You know, I think I got him behind the line about three or four times. Which one? <laughs> just Zonka. teasing, just not... teasing. Yeah, I yeah. got him. I hit him. When the league folded, we played one last game for the fans, and our two quarterbacks quit, Rico Casada and Sonny Sixco, are because they weren't getting their quarterback salaries. We had a team meeting. Everybody gets up and says, OK, no pay, no play. No pay, no play. All right. We get up and do the old deal, take a vote, OK. Next day, two guys didn't show up for the practice, myself and Rick Casada. We lived together. We were the two quarterbacks. We didn't really get in cahoots. We thought everybody else was with us. Got Jim Fossil on the line. He was selling air conditioners in Utah, and he came over to, to be our quarterback. He actually threw the last pass in the, as a player in the World Football League. Jim Fossil did. When I went to work in the air conditioning business, I found I was spending the same amount of hours and I hated it. If I'm going to spend this kind of time, I want to do something I like. And you find guys that are that are doing this because they love it and they want to play football and they kind of bond together. Really, truly guys were playing for the love of the game. 
If you loved football, you would have loved this league. But for guys like me, this was my NFL. And for a lot of guys that had these dreams of playing the big times, this was as big as it got. So uh, there was no downgrade. This, this was good stuff. It was pure. It was just great football. Child ...of one man, Gary Davidson. He had created two other leagues, the American Basketball Association and the World Hockey Association. Now, those leagues failed over time, but a few of the franchises were successful enough to merge with the NBA and the NHL. The WFL vanished without a trace. But it did get off to a promising start. You know, the World Football League is bringing you new dimensions and excitement in pro football. And now let's meet the man who's made it all possible, the founder and commissioner of the WFL, Mr. Gary Davidson. And, Commissioner, I know you must be tremendously pleased at the great enthusiasm uh, which has been accorded the WFL games to date last night and tonight by the hundreds of thousands of fans across the country. Well, Merle, being pleased is an understatement. I'm overwhelmed. I'm awed. I'm having a hard time realizing how successful our openings have been. I think the World Football League was the best deal I ever did. I mean, as far as management, uh, as far as concept, uh, financing was better, but it was the wrong time. It's a high-risk venture basically create a concept and we sell parts of it. You sell a dream. You, you know, you, the guy doesn't want to be known as a bazaar manufacturer. He wants to be known as the owner of a sports franchise. We would go into a city and I had, a, I had an advanced guy and he'd call, he'd call the newspapers and say, we're interested in putting a franchise in Indianapolis. Uh, we think that John Doe owns the biggest brick factory here will be interested. Now, John Doe doesn't know anything about this. So then we call John Doe and say, Joe, John Doe, are you interested in buying a franchise? And he said, no, I don't want to have a football franchise. Then we call the paper and say, John Doe's not interested. The paper then called John Doe and said, aren't you interested? We said, well, I, I might be, because he'd never been called by the sport department before. Then, I, then I'd go see him and talk to him, and I'd say, look, in the press conferences, be sure you watch the cameras, and, and, and this, that's the main reporter to talk to. And all of a sudden, now John Doe is buying into the concept. Well, that concept didn't exist a week before. America, they love sports, and so we, we, we packaged it and sold it. We had people calling us from all over the country. Now they're trying to find out about the league. When Ron Mix learned of the new league, he had completed a Hall of Fame playing career and was legal counsel for the San Diego Chargers. But the lure of the game drew him back as part owner and general manager of the Portland Storm. And I figured, well, why not take a shot at this? I mean, if they're right, then it's kind of like the jackpot, and I get to stay on in something that I really do love. And so I took the job. And as I look back on my life, that's one of the things I wish I had not done, of course, but we've all got those decisions. But it was the right decision at the time. It was the perfect climate to start a new league. It became very obvious to anybody who was following the game that the, the players uh, felt and in fact were, in my opinion, uh, seriously underpaid in comparison to what we perceive the clubs to be earning. That creates the perfect time for a new league to form and take advantage of that unrest and sign a lot of unhappy players. Some entrepreneurs try to reinvent the wheel. Well, Gary Davidson tried to reinvent the football, among other things. He, he created the World Football League football too, Gary Davidson. He, um, the, the original, uh, he, the promotional photos were blue stripes on it, and he, he had, told me he had that in his office, but uh, they used orange because they could see it better at night. There was a lot of different variations. He designed everything. He, he had one ball with the stripes going this way. He had another ball with the laces on both sides, so when the quarterback got it, he'd be ready to fire any time he grabbed the ball, and he helped design all these uniforms. He, he wanted them, you know, different, and this was the 70s, and they, they looked good on TV. A lot of people thought they were kind of loud, but uh, they were just different. Out on the... Uh field, they're demonstrating the color-coded pants that uh, originally they had planned to use in this game tonight. <laughs> no, I wouldn't get in them. No, I was, that, that, they had these, these color-coded pants. That, that's good research. I'm glad you got that. Uh, yeah, we had these wild striped, vertically striped pants and stuff. They were just obnoxious. And I, I, I think that was when we had 750 people there. The guys just looked like clowns. It's an idea that the players did not treat with overwhelming warmth because it's a new idea. What we were trying to do was get as much publicity as possible and throw out as many ideas as possible and then hoping that we'd be on the front page or the back page or the sport pages every day. 
And in July of 1974, the new game in town opened to huge crowds. I think the people are ready to get aboard. In fact, they've proven it with all the... There were 56,000 people at the first game in Philadelphia. What no one knew until later was only 5,000 actually paid to get in. We got to the game, and the stands are packed. And I remember telling my wife, Patty, oh, this is great. We made the right decision. I had my picture on the, on the cover of the program, and I looked at my wife at that time. I said, I'll never have to prove myself again. Then afterwards, we found out that they gave away the tickets at the supermarkets. <laughs> they'd papered the house in Philadelphia, and they'd lied about it. And everything started downhill from that point. But for a moment, I thought I was a genius. And that was the last time Patty thought I was a genius, too. It was just like a, about a 10-second window till we found out the truth. I think it affects everybody because, you know, people start questioning how, how your business practices are. If somebody else in the league is doing that, or are you doing that? It really did affect everybody, and I, I think it was a domino effect, and I think that's when the league really had, had their, their first major problems. I flip on the TV and I see uh, one of the prominent Philadelphia announcers just making a mockery uh, of the league. So, you know, say what they will about the league itself, but don't say that about the athletes that were there that were really giving it everything they could. But the players, honestly, I never heard anything about it. I, they just, once the game started and they were, you know, they just wanted, you know, getting their game checks on a regular, the Philadelphia was one of the teams that got paid every week. So they were pretty happy about that because the Florida Blazers didn't get paid. Neither did the Detroit Wheels or the Shreveport Steamer. It affected the players and their families as well. I thought he was going to lose his job, and I don't want to go back to live in New Jersey with my grandparents. We live in Kearney, New Jersey, where they film The Sopranos, the same street, Kearney Avenue. And I just hated living there. And it's just every time he got cut from a team, we'd pack up and move to New Jersey. Bits of money would come in, and we'd divide it equally among everybody. Everybody would just take a share. Then there was always a lot of wishful thinking and also a lot of representations that new money was going to come in to shore up the league. But it, it was too bad because, really, it was three or four weeks into the season, and it looked like it was all over. The biggest turnout we had, Dave, was when it was band day. And all the bands would come and sit in the stands and play. And then as soon as halftime was over, they're gone. And then you look around and, whoa. We had an Oscar Mayer meat company uh, promotion night. And there was 42,000 people. The next day, we get the phone call to move to Shreveport. I was used to living on a shoestring, being a, being a, a student. So that wasn't a big issue to me. But I certainly saw the pain in a lot of, uh, a lot of the veterans' eyes as it, as it unfolded. And I felt bad for some of the other kids that were. A lot of guys played for free. You know, I guess it's a tough game to play for free. I think the last five games we didn't get paid for. Um, we continued to play with reservations. Um, at one time there, we were talking about, you know, maybe not playing the, the Ch World Bowl yeah, game, the you know, boycott, game. to boycott the championship game here. The championship game was the best because that was, you know, the IRS allowed them to put it on. It wasn't going to be held. And then the IRS decided that a piece of the pie was better than no piece of the pie. So they conducted the game, more or less, with IRS agents around collecting the gate receipts. So there were the Birmingham Americans, who had not been paid in five weeks, about to win the World Bowl. While in their locker room, the sheriff's department was confiscating every piece of equipment to help pay off the team's debts. And money wasn't the object. Really, it's, it sounds strange, but it really wasn't. Because that winning thing got, got to where it was pretty important. A lot of guys say they play this game for free. I don't know how many guys have played for free. But being a champion is what you play it for. In any sport, you have to put a team in New York the Big Apple. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. But one team that didn't make it there was the New York Stars. When the Stars came to town, they were hard pressed to find a home. Ebbets Field and the Polo Grounds were gone. Yankee Stadium and Shea were taken. That left Downing Stadium. Located on Randall's Island in the middle of the East River, it will soon be demolished. But on a dreary day in February, we went there to visit with John Dockery. Now, you may remember John as a defensive back on the Jets' Super Bowl team. Well, when he was in high school, he played football and ran track on this field. And in 1974, he was back, briefly, playing for the New York Stars. New York City, the contrast in life, hard to believe just five years earlier, 
My teammates and I were down in the middle of Manhattan. Bachelors three, Joe Willie, all the excitement, all the energy. And then just a few years later, here we are at Downing Stadium, Randall's Island, New York Stars. It's ironic how life plays tricks on you. I was a defensive back. I remember playing behind Jerry Philbin, one of the toughest players ever, playing with two shoulder separations. John Elliott, one of the most athletic defensive linemen you'll ever meet. George Sauer, perhaps a receiver that retired at the height of his game. And Babe Pirelli was our coach. He was a backup quarterback for Namath. So here we were as a group some five years later in this dingy minor league second grade stadium playing for a league and a team that was on shaky ground. It's more of an impression than anything else. I just remember it kind of being brown or dull, like an impressionistic painting. It wasn't like the Christmas or the clarity of the NFL. It was kind of like just covered by, by clouds. I'm a New York guy, I grew up in Brooklyn. The Dodgers left Brooklyn, as you know, we've never forgiven them. But apparently, the lights from Ebbets Field came here to Downing Stadium, and I guess they were from the 30s. They didn't provide a lot of candle power, <laughs> so they couldn't televise the game. So we were playing anonymously here, you know, in the middle of nowhere, uh, in New York City on an island, with a few thousand people. The media center of the world. <laughs> the media yeah. center of the world. <laughs> and you can't televise it. And we can't be on television. Maybe they had us on radio. I don't even know. And Sherman rolls to his left. He's going to throw the ball. He's going to throw it. He's going to run. He's at the 20, 25, at the 30. Tom Sherman loses that football as they pile it up there at the 35-yard line of the 40. Let's see who's got it. Wow. The mighty, and the sun shines on the mighty black and about the only time it did shine. It was not exactly a happening, <laughs> to say the least. Not a lot of interview requests. <laughs> no, not a lot of autographs. You know, you could get in, you didn't want to shower. And I don't remember there being much hot water. <laughs> they worked about the same, a little drip here and there, you know. Things were just meager. They were tight. Everything was tight. I mean, take a look at these lockers. They aren't much different than they were some 26 years ago. And also, <laughs> heck, you might want to hold it. These uh, stalls weren't exactly the most inviting either. So if you didn't have to go badly, you wouldn't go. You'd just get out of here as fast as you could. I think there was some feeling of that. You know, hey, how can we be expected to be at the top of our game playing in a facility like this, being treated like this? This was a drag, trying to deal with all this stuff. But you either did it or you didn't play football. And as an athlete, that's what you did. It's in your gut, it's in your blood, it's in the fabric of your being, you're going to play. No one was interested, uh, the team wasn't drawing, the owners were in financial trouble, and actually was sold and moved to Charlotte. And when we got to Charlotte, it was like brightness and light and fun and energy, and we were welcomed with open arms. And, and to have people in the stands who cared about what you were doing uh, was a huge lift for the team. Of course, we didn't win enough games to, to really support the town. We went on a losing streak at the end of the season, and that certainly affected the attendance, uh, affected su survival. But you know what? When all was said and done, there were some good things about it as well. A chance to play, a chance to reunite with some of my teammates, a chance to see other parts of the country, like going to Charlotte, even though it wouldn't have been my choice. But it was part of life's journey. Coming back to the stadium, I feel a whole mixture of emotions. There were high moments, and this was certainly one of the low moments, being here at Downing Stadium and ending with the New York Stars. And as I look at this decrepit stadium now falling down, and I realize that the, the wrecking ball will be here soon, I don't know if I want to watch it. It's part of my life. I hate to see it go. Downing Stadium, where Jesse Owens ran in the 1936 Olympic trials, where Pele once played for the New York Cosmos, where generations of high school athletes ran track and played football, and where the New York Stars bid goodbye after seven forgettable games. We found two men in Virginia. One was a star, the other a faceless offensive lineman but they were products of a shared experience. Bob Paschal was a center and long snapper for the Philadelphia Bell. Today, 
He's a neurologist in Nassawatics, Virginia. My mother had MS, so I was pretty much uh, neurology bent from the beginning. But I delayed my career a little bit to enjoy the WFL. Hey, lady. Now a teacher and coach in Newport News, Tommy Riemann was a running back with the Florida Blazers and the league's co-MVP. But I just kind of trusted that everything they were saying that was, it was going to be true and it was going to work out. You know, and I was a little kid saying I wanted to prove something, I want to prove to the NFL, you know, this and that, and, and I just want to run with the football. Tommy was the leading rusher in the WFL's only full season. But here I was, this young guy, I was eating, you know, whether I was eating at McDonald's, I was fresh out of college. I may never eat at another McDonald's because of 20 years ago. We ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner at McDonald's, which is great that they gave us a, a meal ticket, you know, knowing that we had problems, you know, uh, with, with waiting for the paycheck. Some of the things that was happening to guys who were older and had families and children, you know, um, it had to be devastating. It was devastating to them because I saw many of them, uh, some of the frustration, but for me, I, I had never had any money anyway. I had a great experience in Orlando, Florida. I mean, I did. I'm, I was a kid among kids. I think I was at Disney World every night. I grew up very low-income family. I never went to those kind of parks like that. Some of the guys used to, used to tease me, but that was my outlet. You know, uh, yes, we played during the week. We practice all day, and, and people go home with their families. I go to Disney World. <laughs> I often tell people when they say, when they say, uh, what was your pro football career like? I said, it was meteoric, man. <laughs> like a fast rise and a rapid burn in. I was a rookie, and I thought that I was going to play in the bigs, and it was going to be really something. It was going to be on television a lot to compete with these guys who were way bigger than me. And the only way I got in was because I was strong and fast and fierce and I didn't mind paying too much. But I realized right away, halfway through the first season, I had no future in this and it was up or out for me, man. So I got out. The defining moment of my WFL career was we were playing in Portland, Oregon. And the bus broke down from the airport on the way to the hotel. And we got picked up by a bunch of migrant workers in the back of a pickup truck, and I sat next to Ben Hawkins, who was a wide receiver for the Eagles for years. He used to have his chin strap dangling all the time. Just before we got on the back of the pickup truck, after waiting by the broken down bus for an hour, we had to take a leak, and so we were on the side of these railroad tracks in Portland, Oregon, taking a leak. Ben Hawkins says, man, this is bull He said, I've been on the bubblegum cards already. Man, I don't need this anymore. Fair, yeah. When I look back on it now, that just that's not reality. Yes. What I do now is reality. Sick people and dying people is reality. It hurt. Provide a good service here. It makes Man. a difference here. And most of my joints still work. You know, my anterior cruciate was torn on my left leg and it doesn't hurt me too bad. So you never did any surgery on that? You just kind of let it Lifted and got it back to where it was. I'm happy. I can't complain. Oh, yeah. See, now you're going to be on television. <laughs> going home to me was coming back to Newport News, Virginia. I always knew I was going to be a teacher and a coach. I always knew that. This is Jason Victoria, who's going to Harvard University. First team All-State receiver. Since uh, I've been home 12 years now, I've been a high school football coach, and I think I've had a great turnout of developing student athletes. Caught the first pass in WFL history, Vince Papali. And we talked with a guy who threw the last touchdown pass, Jim Fossil. We talked with dozens of people about their WFL experience. And what was most surprising was what we didn't hear. We didn't hear any bitterness. We didn't find anyone who felt betrayed. John Villapiano sent us a note that I think spoke for everyone. He said, upon agreeing to do the interview, so much anger resurfaced. But as we talked, all the great relationships and good times came back to my memory. It was the people. The positive, most positive experience to me was the people. And learning as a 22-year-old that there's, life isn't always fair and it's not always a utopia. That was a learning experience to me. I watched and I listened and I made sure that I never treated people the way that uh, some of our guys, or most of our guys were treated by management.
the scores and the statistics, the rosters and the records, all lost in time. But the WFL was never about those sort of things. What it was about and what it stood for was opportunity. To have gotten into the World Football League and, and to be a part of a team like that, to have made it the way I did as a pure free agent, pure walk-on, something I'll cherish forever because it took me to another level and that level has now given me um, a, a life that, that I love and, 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 and I'm the happiest man on this earth right now. And when I look at this, I kind of I have tears of joy. And having an, ex, an opportunity to showcase my talents and to help touch certain dreams. And, and whether, whether those dreams was to get to the NFL or to do the things that I'm doing today, the World Football League opened that door. 15,000 crowds roaring their approval here tonight. You might find some people who want to write this team off and kiss this team goodbye, but you won't find it at Memorial Stadium here tonight. They're standing and cheering right now as the Hornets sing in and do it again. The World Football League lasted only 22 months, but for the men who played in the league and those who followed it, it never really went away. It's still in their hearts and minds. And when you think about it, that's not such a bad legacy.